My name is Xanathan Axios. That, in my tongue, translates to bringer of the storm. I have always found the name ironic, considering the quiet life I led before, well, before everything. I was a historian, a self-proclaimed rat of the archives. Dust, ancient texts, and long-forgotten civilizations, that was my world. I never yearned for the pulse of a blaster in my grip or the adrenaline that surges when you're staring down an enemy's sights. I was content to let others fight the battles while I waged war against time, rescuing the past from the abyss of oblivion. The Grand Archive of Solari was my haven. Its cavernous halls, lined with data scrolls older than most stars, were a labyrinth I'd gladly lose myself within. The soft rustle of turning parchment, the scent of age and knowledge, the rhythmic hum of the climate control system maintaining the precise conditions for preservation, these were my symphony. There was a rhythm to it all, a comforting order. My research focused on pre-convergence era societies. Those were the times, long before the great galactic unification, when each world existed as an isolated island. It was a period of both remarkable innovation and terrible conflict, and I was captivated by the tenacity of the human spirit throughout those tumultuous times. On other worlds, evolution had taken a kinder route, endowing some species with natural telepathy or regenerative abilities. Humans possessed none of those advantages. Yet, they spread across their planet, built civilizations defying nature, and finally, reached for the stars. Scrappy, stubborn, and frighteningly inventive, that was the legacy of humankind. The day the Rinthians came, the Grand Archive burned, and with it, my world turned to ash. It started as a tremor in the newsfeeds, an anomaly on the far edge of the known systems. A routine trade route had gone dark, an entire convoy of cargo freighters vanishing without a trace. Speculation churned, pirates, a new stellar phenomenon, or perhaps a communications malfunction. I barely paid it heed. I had a symposium on extinct relish dialects to prepare for, oblivious to the approaching maelstrom. Then came the invasion of Kethos. Our peaceful neighbor, a sanctuary planet renowned for its biodomes preserving endangered flora and fauna from a hundred worlds, was decimated within a cycle. Initial reports were confused, garbled cries for aid choked by bursts of static. But the message was chillingly clear, this was not an isolated incident. This was the beginning of a war. My serene life shattered. Solari, a hub for scholarship and interplanetary diplomacy, never imagined it would be a target. We were too valuable, too neutral, too far from strategic routes. Naive, we all were. The Rinthians cared nothing for neutrality or the preservation of knowledge. Their fleets descended upon us with terrifying efficiency. From our intelligence reports, we knew they were warriors, bred and built for conquest. I knew their history, at least a sliver of it pieced together from fragmentary records of past galactic conflicts. Their species was forged in the fires of a ruthless natural selection, evolving on a high-gravity world seething with gargantuan predators. Strength, aggression, and hierarchy were coded into their very DNA. The sight of my first Rinthian warrior will forever be seared into my memory. They'd breached the outer perimeter, and desperation pushed me to the edge of the battlefield. Chaos swirled, the acrid smell of burning ozone, the cacophony of blaster fire, and screams cutting through it all. Then I saw him. A brute cloaked in battlesuit armor, a horrifying contrast to the elegant lines of our defense droids. He moved with a speed that belied his size, tearing through our lines with impossible force. I watched as he snapped a soldier's neck with one monstrous, clawed hand before tossing him aside like a discarded ragdoll. All my scholarly detachment, my historian's analytical distance, vanished in that instant. It was brutal. It was primal. It was a glimpse into a kind of savagery my people had never known, at least not in recent millennia. The battle was lost before it truly began. Solari burned for days. The Grand Archive, my sanctuary, was reduced to a smoldering ruin within hours. As the flames consumed irreplaceable relics, as knowledge I spent my decades safeguarding turned to ash before my eyes, a terrible clarity washed over me. Every species has its ghosts, its echoes of ancient struggles. Humans had theirs buried in fossilized bones and millennia of bloodshed. The Rinthians? Their ghosts were alive, breathing, and bearing razor-sharp fangs. The first six months of the invasion were a blur. Chaos. Fear. Each day was a frantic scrabble for survival, a desperate exodus guided by rumors of hidden settlements and whispers of resistance cells. Families splintered, my own included. Loss piled upon loss, a crushing weight that bent my knees and yet somehow failed to completely break me. I knew, perhaps with a historian's grim fascination, that this was a turning point, a catastrophic rewriting of our collective story. But something amidst the wreckage hardened within me. A fury born not from a warrior's spirit, 
but from the ashes of all I held dear. I would not vanish into the quiet oblivion of the forgotten. If this was a war for the soul of our world, I'd add my verse to the saga, however reluctant my role might be. The whispers started in the refugee tunnels, hushed exchanges in the flickering gloom, punctuated by looks of bewilderment bordering on fear, and the faintest glimmer of hope. Reports trickled in of Rinthian scouting parties wiped out, supply convoys ambushed. The casualties were inexplicable, no sign of our improvised weaponry, no trace of our haphazard hit and run strikes. Just the telltale brutality, but twisted, amplified, as if the savagery the Rinthians inflicted on us was now a mirror turned upon themselves. As the reports multiplied, so did the rumors. Ghost stories flickered like dying embers in the oppressive darkness, tales of a lone figure moving unseen among Rinthian patrols, a wrathful specter doling out swift, vicious retribution. Some spoke of a feral thing, a monstrous predator unleashed. Others whispered of a vengeful spirit risen from the ashes of our fallen cities. Even seasoned resistance members, hardened by loss, began to glance over their shoulders. Personally, I dismissed it as the desperate fantasies of a people clinging to straws. We dealt in hard facts, not folklore. Then came the transmission I'll never forget. It was Sergeant Kira, one of my most trusted scouts. Her voice usually held the steady calm of a woman who had faced down the worst, but this time it crackled with a tension I couldn't place. General, she began, the usual formalities abandoned, something's out here. We found a Rinthian patrol, or rather, what was left of them. Torn limb from limb is the only way to describe it. It wasn't us, sir. This was, animalistic. My gut clenched. I demanded details, pictures, anything. Yet, what Kira described defied any tactical logic I knew. The wounds inflicted on the Rinthians, by some accounts, seemed impossible without powered battle armor, but we had nothing of the sort. Even our jury-rigged explosives were designed to disable vehicles, not leave behind, this level of carnage. Then, the real bombshell. Sir, there's something else. Footprints, but not Rinthian issue. They're too, round, too flat. And massive. Whatever's doing this has to be huge, but we haven't detected anything of that size on scans. Her voice dropped to an urgent whisper, Sir, I think the ghost stories might be real. Hope, that dangerous, double-edged thing, ignited within me. But it was instantly tempered by a strategist's cold assessment. Could this be some unknown ally? A resistance force from a neighboring system, one more technologically advanced than our own? Or was it a new threat? My mind spun possibilities, each as wild and uncharted as the blasted wasteland on our doorstep. If we could make contact, perhaps, but we had to know what we were dealing with first. I sent a team, my best, led by Kira, with orders to prioritize contact with this, entity, this unknown factor in the brutal calculus of war. They set out into the ravaged wasteland between our scattered settlements, following the trail of bodies and bizarre footprints. The risk was monumental, this savior could be even more dangerous than the Rinthians. But what choice did we have? Clinging to inaction now felt akin to surrender. Days stretched into tense silence. I began to fear the worst. Each hour gnawed at me. I won the war of attrition against my own spiraling worry, reminding myself to be a historian, examine the evidence, be wary of emotional conjecture. Yet, in the suffocating dimness of our headquarters, the silence became my relentless enemy. The transmission finally came in a burst of static, just as I was resolved to force myself to an uneasy sleep. Kira, her voice hushed yet thrumming with an energy I hadn't heard in ages. General, we have visual. Requesting immediate tactical advice. Kira's voice cut off sharply, replaced by a startled gasp and then, something else. It was a low, rumbling sound, half growl, half roar, echoing through the calms. For a heart-stopping moment, all I heard was garbled static and Kira's ragged breathing, interlaced with that horrifying, bestial sound. Then Kira spoke again, her voice barely above a whisper, General, it's, I don't know what it is, but it's massive. And, sir, I think it's human. General, we have visual. Requesting immediate tactical advice. Kira's voice cut off sharply, replaced by a startled gasp and then, something else. It was a low, rumbling sound, half growl, half roar, echoing through the calms. The hair on my neck prickled with a dread unlike anything I'd felt facing the Rinthian onslaught. For a heart-stopping moment, all I heard was garbled static and Kira's ragged breathing, interlaced with that horrifying, bestial sound. Then, Kira spoke again, her voice barely above a whisper, General, it's, I don't know what it is, but it's massive. And, sir, I think it's human. My mind raced. A human capable of this? 
It seemed impossible. Yet, I trusted Kira implicitly. If she said it, I had to at least consider the inconceivable. Kira, send visuals, now. And do not engage, repeat, do not engage. Get your team to a safe distance. The feed flickered into focus, and a wave of nausea nearly buckled my knees. The image, distorted by interference, was unsteady, a grainy close-up of what I first assumed was crude battle armor. But as my eyes adjusted, revulsion replaced confusion. That wasn't armor. It was skin. Thick, leathery, scarred hide, mottled with shades of brown and green. It shifted, and the camera panned out precariously. A colossal, impossibly muscular arm came into view, fingers like gnarled branches ending in thick talons. The image lurched upwards, revealing a torso that could only be described as monstrous, a tangle of corded muscle crisscrossed with horrific, glistening wounds. Then, it turned. And the world seemed to tilt on its axis. The face that filled the screen was unmistakably human, yet warped into a grotesque exaggeration. Bloodshot eyes, impossibly wide, burned with a feral intensity beneath a jutting, heavy brow. Its mouth hung open, lips peeled back in a snarl, exposing rows of elongated teeth. Saints preserve us, I whispered, my voice barely audible even to myself. This wasn't a savior. This was a nightmare made flesh. Before I could formulate a new plan, the creature lunged. The transmission devolved into blinding chaos, flashes of claws, the sickening crunch of metal as something, presumably Kira's transmitter, was destroyed, and then screaming. My own voice joined the chorus, a desperate roar for them to fall back, to run. Then, there was only the crackling of dead air. My team, Kira, gone. Swallowed by darkness, consumed by this monstrosity. The weight of their loss hit me hard, a crushing blow on top of the horror of what I had just witnessed. But a flicker of defiance rose within me. I could drown in despair, or I could use my grief, my rage, to fuel me. A new thought crystallized, a twist of logic as horrifying as the creature itself, if this thing is what a human can become. Then perhaps the Rinthians weren't the ultimate monsters in our war. That night, I didn't sleep. I plotted. I planned. I became the general this desperate war needed, even if my battlefield looked nothing like the ones I'd studied in history texts. My enemy weren't just the Rinthians now. It was something far more dangerous, something that had emerged from the shadows of our own desperate struggle. And I swore, by the ashes of my beloved library and the memory of my fallen people, I would find this creature, understand it, and if necessary, destroy it. The fallout of Kira's transmission was devastating. The whispers in the tunnels turned into an uproar of fear and confusion. My already fragile resistance network threatened to unravel as rumors turned wilder with each panicked retelling. I spent the following days quelling the near mutiny, fueled by a relentless mix of adrenaline and simmering rage. My arguments leaned heavily on logic honed in my historian days, the creature, however horrific, was one. The Rinthians were legions. It was pragmatic, cold, and it worked. Fear gave way to a grim determination. I saw it in their eyes, a mirroring of my own resolve. The creature became a dark legend, whispered in the gloom. Some called it the retribution, others the beast. I simply named it Subject H, a chillingly clinical term to distance myself from the horror of what it represented. We knew precious little, it was strong, fast, and territorial, yet with an unnerving intelligence behind its savagery. And most importantly, it seemed to harbor a chillingly specific hatred for Rinthians. We were an armed rebellion fighting blindly against an invisible specter. I needed an edge, needed data. So, I gambled. I authorized raids against Rinthian outposts, a tactical nightmare that went against every defensive instinct I'd honed in the brutal months of fighting. Our goal wasn't to win these skirmishes, but merely to observe. And observe we did. The creature struck at the fringes of these raids, a phantom of bloody havoc. Its movements were a terrifying blur, its strength capable of shredding Rinthian armor with disturbing ease. We began to see a horrifying pattern. There were gouges, fight marks, signs that this was more than rage, it was an insatiable hunger. The medics in our ragtag group began muttering words like adrenal mutation, uncontrolled regeneration, some even whispering of ancient experiments gone wrong. Whatever the cause, the result was clear, Subject H was not simply a man warped by war. He was evolving, feeding on the enemy to become a terrifying apex predator. This grim knowledge did little to comfort, but it gave me a starting point. I pored over historical records, not for battle tactics or heroism, but for tales of monsters born from desperation. There had to be precedent, something in the dark corners of human history. 
I found it buried in fragmented records of the terraforming wars, centuries ago. Stories from remote colonies, whispered accounts of soldiers pushed to the breaking point, their bodies ravaged and transformed by experimental survival stims. These broken warriors would turn on anyone, friend or foe. There was a word for them, ferals. It clicked, Subject H was a feral. This explained his insatiable bloodlust, the regenerative abilities. But how had it happened? The record stated those terraforming war mutations only manifested after prolonged exposure to specifically engineered chemicals. We lacked such terrifying bioweaponry. Then, like a blast of freezing wind, a horrifying possibility hit me. The Rinthians. Could their invasion fleet be carrying something more than troops? Biological warfare was considered abhorrent by most civilized species, but their brutality was well documented. Had they unleashed a contagion designed to mutate our people, turning us against ourselves in some twisted strategy? Had they created Subject H unknowingly? The idea made me seethingly sick, but the brutal logic of it was chillingly plausible. A plan began to form, less a strategy and more a desperate gamble. Subject H was formidable against individual patrols, but could it hold against a concentrated Rinthian attack? If my contagion theory was correct, we had a chance to observe its strengths and weaknesses under focused, heavy fire. We set the trap in a desolate, cratered expanse of no man's land and area I privately named Kira's Lament. Bait was easy, a supply convoy, loaded with enough explosives to level a small outpost. The news was spread through our network, a tantalizing whisper meant to reach Rinthian ears. Then we waited, a tense knot of hunters ensconced in the blasted ruins, watching the rigged convoy with a grim fatalism. They came, not with the speed or stealth of Subject H. Rinthian shock troopers descended with brutal efficiency. They secure the perimeter, their weapon discipline terrifyingly precise. They didn't fall for the trap immediately, they knew we were out there, desperate. A waiting game began, nerves stretched to breaking point on both sides. Then, just as I was about to call a retreat, it appeared. Not with a roar, but with an eerie silence. It materialized from the blasted landscape, its mottled form blending disturbingly well with the scorched earth. The Rinthians sensed it before they saw it. There was a collective flinch, recognition in the rigidness of their posture. They knew this was not the usual resistance rabble. Subject H struck not with a charge, but an unnerving stalk. It circled the Rinthians, less like a predator about to pounce, more like a butcher appraising livestock. The first attack was a blur of motion. A Rinthian trooper was lifted bodily, his scream cut short as he was bisected with casual, horrific brutality. Then, chaos. The Rinthians, despite their initial hesitation, were elite troops. They unleashed a torrent of fire, energy beams stitching burning lines across the ground. Subject H was fast, impossibly so. Yet, wounds began to appear, steaming gashes in that monstrously toughened flesh. It roared then, a bone-shaking sound that seemed to rattle the very air, and its form seemed to grow larger, muscles bulging obscenely. The Rinthians were relentless, but Subject H was a force of nature. It tore through their ranks, its claws, its teeth, finding purchase even in their armor. Then came the true horror, its wounds, instead of crippling it, seemed fuel it. They knitted clothes with sickening speed, and its counterattacks grew in strength and ferocity. The tide turned with a swiftness that chilled even my rage-fueled blood. One by one, the Rinthians fell, not to tactical brilliance, but to an onslaught of primal savagery. It was an uncomfortable truth this monstrosity, our unintentional horror, was outmatching some of the most advanced warriors in the known galaxy. Subject H, a creature born of our desperation, was proving more effective than any weapon we possessed. Each Rinthian death fed the inferno. Subject H moved quicker, its roars echoed across the wasteland, and its body thrummed with a terrible, unstoppable energy. The Rinthians, their discipline cracking, began to retreat. I gripped the rough edge of shattered concrete, forcing myself to remain an observer. They were the enemy, I reminded myself. Yet, in the face of the nightmare Subject H embodied, even that conviction wavered. We didn't need to interfere. Subject H tore through the fleeing troops with methodical brutality. When it was over, a cratered ground was littered with broken bodies, scorched armor, and an unnerving silence. Subject H hunched over a Rinthian corpse, its breathing ragged and harsh. With a gruesome fascination, I watched its wounds, gashes left behind by energy weapons slowly, too slowly for my comfort, disappear. General. One of my officers, a grizzled woman named Mira who had lost an arm to the Rinthians, snapped me back to reality. You'll want to see this. They'd salvaged something from the wreckage, a Rinthian command unit. It was heavily damaged, 
flickering with internal shorts, but functional. My knowledge of their language was rudimentary, but enough to decipher bits and pieces. Intelligence reports, troop casualty projections, and then one fragment made my heart sink. Contagion initiative phase 2 mutation rates exceeding projections. Uncontrolled adaptivity. The rest was a jumble of broken code, but the implications were stark. The Rinthians had unleashed this, intentionally or not. We hadn't created Subject H, they had. But, with the cold pragmatism forced upon me by war, I also saw an opportunity. The command unit, once deciphered, might yield more information, weaknesses, Rinthian reaction strategies, perhaps even the origin of the contagion triggering these horrifying mutations. This was more than just studying the enemy now. Understanding Subject H was perhaps the only path to developing a defense against our own transformation. I left orders to retrieve what was left of the Rinthian dead. I was met with resistance. Sir, those things, no one should have to touch. It was a sentiment shared by many. Subject H instilled not just fear, but a primal revulsion, and touching remains riddled with that monstrous energy was an act that went against our every instinct. We touch the remains of our own fallen, don't we? I replied, my voice sharper than I intended. These, I gestured to the gruesome battlefield, these can save the lives of those still fighting. That is a sacrifice worthy of honor. It worked. Duty mixed with the simmering defiance of the Rinthians fueled them to the horrifying task. Our scientists began their grim analysis, a twisted echo of my own scholarly pursuit of knowledge, now turned toward survival. But as they worked, a disquiet began to gnaw at me. The Rinthian fragments hinted at a contagion, yes, but not one I recognized. Bioweapons were usually fast-acting, designed for swift decimation. This, whatever it was, was slow, insidious, warping its victims into a grotesque parody of themselves. There was something else at play here, and the key to understanding it might lie not on a dusty battlefield but within Subject H itself. We needed a prisoner. The idea was insane and carried monumental risk. Capturing this creature alive seemed a fool's errand. But with each scrap of tactical data we gained, with every report of how Subject H's presence impacted the flow of the war, the idea hardened into a terrifying necessity. It was a decision that would have appalled the historian I used to be, the scholar who believed in the sanctity of all life. War had stripped me of such luxuries. The operation was as meticulously planned as it was reckless. More bait, this time in the heart of one of our hidden settlements. We couldn't risk an open fight, so we laid a trap. Drugged rations to slow it, subtly sabotaged structures designed to collapse around it, and our people, hand-picked volunteers, eyes filled with resolute fear, were primed to withdraw at the first sign of trouble. I felt like a spider luring a monstrous insect, and the guilt was near crippling. Subject H came, drawn by the scent of an easy battle. Our makeshift settlement fell with sickening ease, it moved less like a predator now, more like a force of nature, a storm tearing through a flimsy paper town. The drugged rations had some effect, slowing its relentless onslaught. Structures collapsed, pinning its gargantuan form under tons of rubble. Our troops, using the chaos as cover, swarmed in, binding the creature with reinforced cables designed to restrain armored vehicles. It thrashed against its bonds with a strength that made the ground tremble. Then came the roar, rattling the bones of everyone present, carrying not only rage but a terrible, mournful undertone. For the first time, I heard something other than bloodlust in that chilling cry. Our tranquilizers barely scratched the surface of its unnatural resilience. But it was enough. Subject H, the beast of legend, was wrestled into a hastily converted prison transport. The settlement was a smoking ruin, and we had lost lives. Yet, amidst the ashen grief, a perverse sense of triumph twisted its way through me. The makeshift prison, deep within our headquarters, was a testament to desperation. Reinforced blast shields bolted to ancient stone, hastily jury-rigged energy dampeners, and a team of heavily armed guards, it all felt like a flimsy dam against a raging torrent. Subject H, a creature born from the crucible of war, was an unsettling force of nature. In the harsh light of the prison, the creature looked less like a monster from myth and more like a tragically mutated human. Scars crisscrossed its massive body, now pulsing with an inner bioluminescence. Scientists buzzed around the enclosure, taking readings, muttering of mutation rates and metabolic anomalies. To them, this was a fascinating puzzle. To me, it was a constant reminder of the darkness we had been forced to confront. Days bled into weeks. Subject H refused nourishment, communicating only through frustrated snarls and roars. The roars echoed through the tunnels, a constant, unsettling symphony. Sleep became a luxury, haunted by the image of the creature's feral intelligence and the raw pain flickering in its eyes. 
The Rinthians, unsurprisingly, escalated their attacks. Brutal scorched earth tactics became their new norm. There was a horrifying logic to it, Subject H was drawn to conflict, a chaotic weapon used against them. They were driving it towards us, hoping we'd collapse under the strain. One night, Mira, her face creased with exhaustion and a flicker of something new, empathy, approached me. There's something different, she said, her voice hushed. The creature. It's trying to communicate. Intrigued and apprehensive, I followed her to the prison cell. Subject H was huddled in a corner, its gargantuan form straining against the restraints. The luminous scars pulsed brighter than ever, reflecting its ragged breathing. As I approached, it lifted its head, and in the dimness, its eyes held a chilling focus. Then, it spoke. The voice was guttural, slurred, as if the mechanisms of speech themselves were at war with its twisted physiology. But the words, while broken, were clear, echoing with a mournful fatigue. Stop. The pain. A collective shiver ran through the assembled scientists and guards. My own mind reeled. Subject H, a terrifying legend, was yearning for peace, not annihilation. Before I could respond, the creature surged forward. It wasn't a violent attack, but a desperate lunge, pushing itself against the unyielding energy shield. The air crackled, and the creature slumped back, the bioluminescent scars dimming with exhaustion. What can we do? I asked aloud, the question hanging heavy in the air. Subject H's voice, a tired rasp, responded with a single plea, help. End. The hunger. It wasn't just about physical needs. There was something deeper, annoying void driving the creature's actions. A horrifying realization dawned on me. The Rinthians hadn't just unleashed a weapon. They had inflicted a curse, a relentless hunger fueled not by bloodlust, but by a terrible, unyielding loneliness. Suddenly, Subject H was more than a threat. It was a distorted reflection of ourselves, a victim of this brutal war as much as we were. The scholar within me yearned to understand, to find a way to heal not just the world, but this soul trapped in a monstrous form. That night, I dreamt not of burning libraries, but of a lonely figure silhouetted against a starlit sky. An inhuman figure, yes, but in its shadowed eyes, I glimpsed a flicker of hope, a desperate plea for connection and solace. Perhaps, within the ashes of war, we could find a flicker of redemption, not just for our ravaged world, but for the tormented creature who shared our fate. The creature's plea, help, end, the hunger, echoed in my mind, a discordant counterpoint to the ceaseless drumbeat of war. The Rinthians pressed their advantage ruthlessly. Yet, amidst the smoke and despair, something had shifted within our ranks. Fear mingled now with a desperate resolve, fueled by the haunting realization that Subject H, the beast of legend, was both weapon and prisoner of a relentless, gnawing loneliness. My command center, a claustrophobic chamber carved from ancient rock, was filled with a tense hum, less like a military headquarters and more like a makeshift laboratory. Our scientists, invigorated by a purpose beyond mere survival, poured over data on the creature's unique biology. Their hushed exchanges were peppered with strange, hopeful phrases, fragments that would have seemed like madness in the days before, metabolic manipulation, regenerative dampening, and most audaciously, synaptic recoding. They theorized wildly, some venturing that the Rinthian contagion was a crude tool, capable of monstrous transformation yet unstable by design. Perhaps its purpose was not to create super soldiers but to break morale, a terrifying spectacle of self-destruction. If so, the Rinthians had underestimated human adaptability. Subject H wasn't a mindless destorying machine, its suffering suggested a twisted form of resilience, a mind desperately clinging to its humanity in the face of overwhelming mutation. But theories offered little comfort. We needed a tangible solution, and time was a luxury we didn't have. Each Rinthian attack brought us closer to breaking, while Subject H grew more unstable, a terrifying powder keg threatening to consume us all. My own transformation shocked me most of all. I, a historian drawn into a brutal conflict, was now orchestrating a gamble with monstrous odds. I found myself arguing for the unthinkable. Instead of destroying Subject H, we might find a way to stabilize him, even channel his monstrous strength. My argument was a desperate one, laced with cold practicality. Subject H, for all its horrifying unpredictability, was undeniably effective. Our hit-and-run tactics could only hold back the Rinthian horde for so long. If we could somehow gain a semblance of control, even temporarily harness the creature's fury, might we gain the upper hand and force a stalemate? The decision was made in a tense meeting filled with whispered dissent and grim determination. It went against every sense of morality we held dear, but morality, like peace, was a casualty of this war. The plan was audacious in its simplicity. 
we would draw the Rinthian forces into a massive ambush, with our remaining resistance fighters acting as the bait. It was a desperate play, putting countless lives on the line. Yet, at a signal, our troops would fall back, revealing not an easy victory, but a nightmare. We would release Subject H, goaded by our scientists into a frenzy using recovered fragments of Rinthian stimulants discovered at the Kira's Lament site. It was, ultimately, a monstrous strategy, using the enemy's own weaponized cruelty against them. We became the architects of calculated chaos, the instigators of a terrifying spectacle designed to break the Rinthians not just militarily, but psychologically. One moonless night, the trap was sprung. The Rinthians, drawn by the promise of crushing our last bastion, fell upon our decoy troops with terrifying efficiency. Their triumphant battle cries filled the communications channels, a wave of brutal certainty. Then, we unleashed our response. Subject H, tormented by the stimulants and the scent of conflict, was a monstrous storm unleashed. The battle wasn't so much fought as it was endured by the Rinthians. Soldiers known for their iron discipline were reduced to terrified figures fleeing from not just a superior foe, but a force beyond their comprehension, a creature from the darkest recesses of their own bioweaponry gone rogue. I watched the carnage unfold via crude monitor feeds, feeling a sickening mix of elation and revulsion. The historian in me wept. The strategist saw the tide turn, the Rinthian advance crumble. Yet, even in victory, there was a lingering unease. The cheers echoing through our tunnels were tainted with the knowledge of the monstrous price of survival. And as swiftly as it had come, Subject H vanished, retreating into the scarred wilderness with a mournful roar. It was far from the decisive weapon we'd so desperately hoped for, but its impact was undeniable. The Rinthians would not only remember this defeat, they would now fear the very shadows they sought to conquer. That potent mix of fear and uncertainty just might buy us the thing we craved most desperately, time. The aftermath of the ambush was chaos woven through with a thread of grim satisfaction. The Rinthian advance had stalled, their forces disoriented and shaken. Their communications intercepts hinted at confusion in the high command, a scrambling to understand the horror they had unleashed upon themselves. Yet, even in the respite we'd carved with monstrous force, a nagging unease lingered. Subject H was still an uncontrollable threat, a terrifying wildcard in this brutal calculus of war. The lull in major offensives allowed our scientists to focus on Subject H analyzing the remnants of the Rinthian stimulants, they began mapping out the creature's frightening metabolic cycles. There was a brutal cycle to its transformation, the stimulants triggered hyperaggression, fueling its monstrous strength. But in its aftermath came a crippling crash, a metabolic shutdown that rendered the creature lethargic, almost docile. If we could predict or even trigger this cycle, we might gain a sliver of control. But, I was no longer satisfied with brute manipulation. The creature's pleas, its desperation, haunted me. I began combing Rinthian data fragments, not for battlefield strategies, but for any mention of their horrifying contagion. And there, buried in encrypted medical reports, I found something that sparked a flicker of impossible hope. The Rinthians, with their cold, brutal logic, didn't see Subject H as an outlier, but a prototype, a first iteration. Embedded in the code were notes theorizing that metabolic stabilization might be possible. But their solution was chilling, an implanted control module, a neural device designed not to heal, but to enslave. Yet, their failure might be our key. If we could reverse engineer the concept, we could perhaps develop a way to subdue the creature's monstrous mutations without destroying its core humanity. Suddenly, our makeshift prison wasn't just a holding cell, but a beacon of a radical idea, redemption, not just for our world, but perhaps for the soul trapped within the beast. But time was our ever-present enemy. The Rinthians would regroup, adapt. To save Subject H and ourselves, we had to become something entirely new. Our resistance transformed overnight. Fighters became technicians, channeling their honed skill into crafting delicate circuitry under the tutelage of baffled scientists. Tunnels filled with the hum of salvaged Rinthian tech cobbled together, a symbol of both our desperation and defiant spirit. Our objective shifted, we weren't preparing for the next battle, but for a rescue mission. We set another trap, not to destroy, but to capture. News of Subject H weakened was carefully leaked through our network, a tantalizing law for the Rinthians. It was a monstrous gamble, if we failed, we would deliver them the means for total victory. But we were out of less reckless options. News traveled across the ravaged wasteland. Recon units brought tales back, strange sightings, not of Subject H in its monstrous prime, but a hunched, lumbering figure, its roars reduced to pained moans. Was it real? Or was this the final, brutal act in the Rinthian psychological game? We could only wait and see. Then, Mira approached me, 
The scarred warrior's face tight with tension. General, she said, her voice grim, we have a problem. She gestured to the distant hills, smoke trails marring the pristine morning sky. It seems we're not the only hunters this time. My blood ran cold. Another faction had appeared, drawn by rumors of the beast, whether to exploit or destroy, we couldn't know. The clock ticked faster. Our desperate bid to save Subject H now became a race against an unknown enemy. Were they rogue Rinthians, seeking to rectify their mistake, or something far worse? The world that had been a simple battleground now was a chessboard of terrifying complexity. The war was about to change in a way none of us could have foreseen. And I, Salath Anaxios, the historian, the reluctant general, found myself not only fighting for survival, but on the cusp of a rescue mission to save the very monster we had all come to dread. The arrival of the new faction tipped the scales from a desperate gambit into utter madness. Our makeshift force, bolstered with more scholars turned technicians than battle-hardened soldiers, was pitifully ill-equipped for a battle on two fronts. Yet, hesitation was a death sentence. We had to reach Subject H first. We mobilized with the grim efficiency of the damned. I led the team, my historian's robes replaced with patched combat fatigues, the weight of an energy rifle unfamiliar on my shoulder. Yet, the most dangerous weapon we carried wasn't the salvaged Rinthian tech, but the fragile hope that the creature, ravaged by the contagion, might retain some shred of the man it once was. The wasteland stretched before us, a canvas of brutal beauty scarred by conflict. The air thrummed with tension, the usual crackle of calms replaced by an unnerving, watchful silence. We were exposed, hunted, and we weren't alone. Our trackers spotted signs of the other force, not Rinthian, but something far more unsettling. Equipment of unknown origin, footprints too light, too disciplined. Whoever they were, they moved like ghosts, leaving only the faintest whisper of their passage. The final stage of our trap was a jagged ravine, a natural choke point with eerily good visibility. Here, under the harsh glare of twin suns, we set up the neural suppression module, an ungainly mix of cobbled together Rinthian tech and our own frantic ingenuity. It thrummed with a raw, unstable energy, mirroring my own desperate hope. Subject H came not with a roar, but a ragged, croaking moan echoing between desolate cliffs. It was a monstrous parody of its former self, hunched, limbs swollen grotesquely, the luminescent scars flickering on the edge of darkness. Yet, its once burning eyes now held a dull, vacant stare. This was a creature on the precipice of total degradation. The first of the mystery force emerged then, not from the cliffs, but the ground itself. They rose from camouflaged burrows, figures clad in insectal black armor, insectal, their weapons sleek and chillingly efficient. Their focus wasn't on us, but on the weakened creature, their movements mirroring ours with lethal precision. We were no longer playing a game against the Rinthians, but trapped in a deadly standoff with an enigmatic new enemy. I gave the signal, and our scientists activated the suppression module. It thrummed to life, emitting a pulse invisible to the eye but felt deep in the bone. Subject H staggered, a roar bubbling in its ruined throat, then collapsed with a pitiful whimper. Now, more vulnerable than ever, it was a prize neither side was willing to relinquish. The first shot echoed like thunder between the cliffs, and around us, the world exploded into chaos. Our ragtag fighters, scholars armed with jury-rigged energy rifles, unleashed a desperate barrage against the sleek, armored figures. They fell back into their burrows, seemingly taken aback by our resistance. But for how long? Scrambling towards the creature, I found myself caught in a deadly crossfire. Ranged combat was never my strength. I was a historian who should have been safe within the dusty stacks of archives, not the brutal dance of a three-sided battlefield. A blast of energy sizzled past my ear, close enough to feel the burn. It was Mira, her scarred face lit with desperate resolve, drawing fire away from me. I reached Subject H. Up this close, its ravaged form was a grotesque tragedy, my heart twisting with a strange mix of fear and pity. I fumbled with the neural implant, scavenged tech and wild theory my only weapons against the monstrousness the Rinthians had unleashed. Then, a searing pain ripped through my side, flinging me backwards. I landed hard, the world tilting into a blur of pain. Through the haze, I registered the sleek shapes rising from their burrows again, their relentless advance now directed not at the creature, but at me. Had I become the priority? Did they understand what we were trying to do? My world narrowed to the figure standing above me. A merciless visor reflected the harsh sunlight, the barrel of their weapon gleaming. Time seemed to stretch then snap forward. Another figure, a monstrous blur of speed and tattered flesh, slammed into my attacker, sending them both sprawling. It was Subject H. In its eyes, there was a flicker, not of malevolent rage, 
but a brutal, protective instinct. It scooped me up with surprising gentleness, a mewling sound escaping its ravaged throat. Then, it ran, lumbered with surprising strength, away from the battle. My dimming vision caught fragments of the impossible, Mira and our surviving band holding back the sleek figures, buying time amidst smoke and screams. Darkness closed in, yet not a terrifying oblivion, but a strange, numbed calm. The creature still held me, moving with surprising speed, not towards the Rinthian front lines but deeper into the desolate wastes. As consciousness slipped away, a startling thought sliced through the gathering fog, if this was the end, I was not dying at the hands of the Rinthians, nor those of our new terrifying enemies. I was being carried off, perhaps to my doom or perhaps to something strangely akin to salvation, by the monster I had sworn to fight. 